Welcome to the front lines of gender justice, our second session. We had some fireworks last week and we'll see what we can do today to keep the heat, keep the heat going. Um, this is Rhea Tabakumar, who is the director of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project. An amazing lawyer, a wonderful person, a creative thinker about how we expand forms of gender justice in this complicated world we live in. Before directing the Women's Rights Project, uh, Rhea was at the ACLU's LGBT and HIV project. Before that, Cravath? No. Oh, the LDF, that little known place called LDF, yes. NAACP and then Cravath. Um, and then before that, a Sixth Circuit clerkship and a um, SDNY clerkship before that and NYU Law School before that. <clears throat> I think that's the through line without a lot of embellishment. Um, so what I'm gonna ask you just to start us off with is tell us a little bit about the project. What's what's cooking besides the two cases we've looked at for today, which we'll talk about in a minute. I think I have successfully turned the microphone on. So that's 50% of the battle. I don't know about fireworks. I told um, Alyssa who is an intern of ours this semester, I felt really sorry for whoever uh, followed J Mac and there was a beat and we realized it was me. So here we are. Um, just to back up for a moment for from current history, I just wanna walk back to the founding of the Women's Rights Project because it actually, I think, relates quite closely to yes, both of the cases you. you all read for today. So just bear with me on this um, tangent that I promise is related. Um, so the ACLU's Women's Rights Project was founded in 1972 uh, by Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Brenda Feigen. And the reason that the ACLU's legal director decided to dedicate a team of lawyers to fighting for women's rights was really the Supreme Court's decision the year before in Reed v. Reed, um, which of course was the 1971 decision uh, that marked the first time the Supreme Court had ever found that a gender classification was unconstitutional. Um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, with assistance from many other ACLU lawyers, including Dorothy Kenyon and Polly Murray, had put together uh, the ACLU's brief, arguing that the probate statute was unconstitutional. And for those who don't remember, this was the rule that said um, when a person dies without a will and two relatives, in this case, parents are equally situated to the decedent to serve as administrator, that the man will automatically be preferred to the woman. So in other words, we're going to assume that every man is more capable of settling an estate than any woman, which may sound irrational today, but of course was no more or less irrational than other classifications the court had blessed, including that women could be barred from being attorneys, that women could be automatically excused from serving on juries, the woman could be prohibited from working as bartenders unless their husband or father owned the bar. So if you think about the world we lived in in 1971 and what incredible sea change this moment was and something is uh, in some ways anodyne as a probate. Um, and the victory in that decision which is what sort of inspired Ari Nair, who was then the legal director at the National ACLU to uh, dedicate a team of lawyers to building on that um, and seeing sort of what it could become. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg was sort of the brains of the project and, and Brenda was a seasoned civil rights lawyer who was gonna be sort of the movement person um, with the feminist connections to make the magic happen together. They did indeed work on making the magic happen. The reason that I mention all of this, of course, is that one of the principal projects was to get past the decision in Reed, which said simply that the gender classification there was irrational and to actually um, achieve some form of heightened judicial review for gender-based classifications, which of course, most people think is a project that was completed during the time that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was director of WRP, which ended in 1980 when she was appointed to the DC circuit. Or maybe if you don't think it was done by then, then you think maybe it was done by 1996 when the court decided the VMI case. And as you can see for both of the readings for today, it is still in fact hotly contested whether in fact heightened scrutiny applies to all gender classifications or whether there are some classifications that are uh, either so trivial as in the cases of, of dress codes or so important um, as in the military context as to somehow be exempt from heightened scrutiny. So either it's too important or it's not important enough, but whichever it is, um, somehow there is still a backdoor for heightened scrutiny um, that we are very much fighting to continue the work um, that RBG and Brenda began in the 1970s. Do you happen to remember what law school um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg graduated from? No, Catherine, I don't. <laughs> It would be Columbia Law School. <laughs> and do you happen to remember at what law school Ruth Bader Ginsburg taught? Women and the law. Gee, I wonder what law school that could be. School. So we have a great and deep and long connection to RBG 
as does the ACLU, um, uh, which it makes it all the worse that I didn't mention that earlier. So I'm glad you did. Yeah. At NYU here, I'm being downtown, uptown. It's a good law school. Um, so it's a little unfair, I think, to talk about sort of what are the hot button issues besides these cases, because as you all likely know, the Peltier case is up on cert before the Supreme Court right now, and that is um, taking up a great deal of my time and attention, if I'm being quite candid. Um, but just to name a couple of other things we are up to, um, despite the disaster that was 2022 for women in many ways, we actually had quite a few victories in Congress um, that went unnoticed, and we are now in the process of working to enforce and implement those. So just to give a quick rundown, um, in March, Congress passed the Viol against, Violence Against Women Act reauthorization of 2022. Um, this uh, statute looks very different than the Violence Against Women Act of 1994 that folks may remember um, and which has been heavily criticized by carceral feminists as relying uh, overly on criminal legal responses to gender-based violence. Um, the reauthorization of 2022 includes for the first time a housing title, which was drafted by a WRP attorney, um, which will help protect survivors um, who are at risk of eviction for having placed emergency calls from their home, um, a problem that is unfortunately very real. So we have no emergency response system other than the criminal legal system. You call the police in a moment of crisis, and then the same police uh, then can come back and evict you because now your home is considered a nuisance um, and you have to be gone. Just one example of how we're thinking about uh, alternatives to the criminal legal system and ways uh, that we can keep ourselves safe, ways that survivors really can feel safe. And at the very tail end of the year, as part of the appropriations uh, omnibus, we saw the passage of two major pieces of legislation. So the Pump for Nursing Mothers Act extends lactation protections to 9 million workers that were left out by the much better known um, Affordable Care Act of 2010. Great law, left 9 million people out. Um, we got them in for the most part, some asterisks uh, with pump. And then uh, save the best for last. Uh, the third piece of legislation, the trifecta was the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. This is the first um, piece of federal legislation expressly uh, prohibiting pregnancy discrimination since 1978. Um, and I think PUF is a great story of how, you know, we're all feeling this moment, the courts will not save us. But the truth is when it comes to pregnancy and gender, the court has really never saved us. So the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act is an update to the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978. Why did we need the Pregnancy Discrimination Act in 1978, you ask, when Congress just 14 years earlier had passed Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which says it's illegal to discriminate against anyone in the workplace based on sex? Well, because the Supreme Court in 1974 said that has absolutely nothing to do with pregnancy. And of course, you can penalize workers for being pregnant because that has nothing to do with gender. There are some people who are pregnant. There are some people who are not pregnant. What does gender have to do about it? And so Congress had to step in in 1978 and pass the Pregnancy Discrimination Act to say, actually, gender has everything to do with it. And when we said sex, that included pregnancy. Then we had the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. What became clear is that the PDA required only that employers treat pregnant workers not worse than other workers. It didn't require them to treat anyone fairly at all. And I think we all know I uh, can easily imagine how employers exploited that to say, well, we didn't treat this worker badly because she was pregnant. We just don't let anybody take a bathroom break, or we don't let anybody sit on a stool behind the cash register, or we don't let anybody carry a water bottle on the on the uh, retail sales floor, or we don't let anybody go on desk duty. This question got back to the Supreme Court in 2015 in a case called Young versus UPS, and Peggy Young was the UPS driver who had a lifting restriction during her pregnancy, and she said, hey, why can't you put me on desk duty? There are all these guys who have desk duty, including people who were off the road because of their DUI convictions. You made space for them and you don't have space for me because of my pregnancy. Why is that? And in a rare and surprising victory-ish, the Supreme Court ruled for Peggy Young and we all thought, okay, great, finally, now we've gotten it. We've shown that you have to show basic decency when it comes to pregnancy. And the years since Young was decided in 2015 have been essentially a mess of litigation, much of it on our docket, unfortunately. Um, and courts and employers have uh, totally failed to get it right or to understand what basic decency requires. And that is why we've had to go back and pass the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which instead of merely being an equality law, really is an equity law in the sense that it requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations uh, for pregnant workers. When you think about the kinds of accommodations that pregnant workers need and the fact that you know, 85% of women in the workforce will be pregnant at some time, many of them, well, during their working years, many of them more than once. 
So the failure to provide accommodations to these workers in particular uh, has a really, really disproportionate impact on women that can compound over time. Very excited to have these new laws, lots of work to enforce them. We will be turning to that in 2023, assuming that we are not uh, busy convincing the Supreme Court that 3.7 million children at charter schools do in fact have constitutional rights. That was a lot. Um, so to pick up your last, um, the framing of the pregnancy issue, your last remarks, how do we make these arguments in a way that don't um, overdetermine pregnancy as something that only happens to women? in a way that recognizes trans men and other people who don't, don't identify with male or female get pregnant too. How do you do, how do, you do both? Because it's true, it's overwhelmingly women, people who identify as women, but not only. It's a great question. And you know, I think Title VII in some ways makes this easy for us and that Title VII and, and the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which is an amendment to Title VII says, you know, protects individuals from discrimination on the basis of sex. And so, one of the themes that you'll see in our brief in Peltier, so we're sort of skipping around here, is, you know, employers often try to resist this by making sort of group-based arguments, men versus women, pregnant people versus non-pregnant people. And Title VII actually is not concerned with any of those questions. Title VII is concerned with the individual and whether the individual has experienced discrimination because of their sex. And when it comes to pregnancy, it's always going to relate to the person's sex in one way or another, regardless of what that person's sex or gender identity, in fact, is. There's a way in which we have to move away from this idea that, you know, we have to prove some kind of group-based burden. That's a trick that employers have played on us to try and uh, get us to sort of make these comparisons and say, well, and men, you know, sure, women have these problems, men have other problems, um, kind of all comes out in the wash. We fired her, but we also fired him, right? And Title VII for forces us, allows us maybe to really focus on the individual. And I think pregnancy, you know, much like sexual orientation or gender identity, as you saw in the courts discriminant in Bostock, it's really impossible to describe sort of pregnancy and reproduction without reference to gender. And so any given person's capacity for pregnancy, lack of capacity for pregnancy, capacity to impregnate someone else always is going to come back to some aspect of that person's sex, which we think that means it's impermissible to take that capacity or lack of capacity into account when making employment decisions. Has that specific argument won in any of the litigation that you've undertaken? Because I, I have found this a very challenging needle to thread with courts that are used to thinking about M versus F and the, the Fs aren't doing well compared to the Ms. So I think the real answer when it comes to pregnancy is courts haven't really had to grapple with it, but are going to have to soon for a couple of reasons. So the main place this comes up is Title VII. And as I've already said, in 1978, Congress said, sex includes pregnancy. So courts haven't had to do that analytical to work to figure out why is it that pregnancy discrimination is sex discrimination. Congress kind of did it for them. The same has been true in Title IX. So, you know, here's another fun fact. I talked about the Supreme Court decision in 1974 saying pregnancy discrimination is not sex discrimination. Well, in 1975, what was then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare issued the original Title IX implementing regulations in which the government said quite clearly, actually, hey, yeah, sex discrimination does include pregnancy discrimination. That was in the original Title VII regs dating back to 1975 before Congress had passed the PDA. So a great example of uh, what radical executive action can do. Um, and so for many years, I think it's just been accepted. We are now seeing because of Dobbs and because of the push uh, to restrict not only access to abortion, but rights, everything. Everything. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of things. Everything, I think, is the right answer. Um, we are now seeing folks say, actually, no, Title IX doesn't prohibit pregnancy discrimination. So we're starting to see the other side take that up. And I think it's going to force us to really advance, to go back to first principles, to go back to the statutory language in a way that, candidly, we've had shortcuts really since the 1970s and haven't had to, to sort of show our work. So picking up on this idea that the right is going after everything, and there's only so many resources you have at the ACLU, you have a lot of resources, but they are limited. How do you think, how do you decide which work to do in the constellation of the work you could do? The phone must be ringing off the hook all the time of please take my case, never mind you just looking out in the world and know what's going on. And, and given that you're not the only litigation and policy shop working in the gender justice space, how do you, how do you um, see the ACLU's relationship to all that work and how do you do agenda setting as the director? How much time do we have? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we do, you know, try to identify strategic priorities and they really are key to this question of, right, a couple things. One, what is the what is the problem we see in the world in the law, right? There are a whole lot of problems in the world that have to do with gender that are not necessarily legal problems. A lot of other very talented people are tackling them. We are impact litigators. We have some superpowers, but they are few. And we try to stick to those problems that we think are within our wheelhouse to fix. So what's the legal problem for which there is actually a legal solution that we think we could win in the next, I don't know, five years, three years, 10 years, right? Some amount of time that is fixed. It's not forever, but it's not tomorrow either. And, you know, that really eliminates a whole lot of issues that other might, might feel really compelling to work on. And, um, you know, I find that really clarifying to do ahead of time, because then you've said, here's the kind of problem that we think is susceptible to a legal solution that we think we could win. And we have a plan for getting there. We have a if, if circuit by circuit plan. If it's a district court plan, maybe there are no decisions. We want to get the first decision, right? So we have a plan for getting there. We can do it. And those are the things that we are going to either say yes to, or we're going to look out for. Then we're going to leave some room in our docket because this is going to happen and some things are going to happen. And we, as the ACLU Women's Rights Project, are going to feel like we can't not respond. So Betsy DeVos issues her Title IX rule. We can't not respond to some pieces of this, right? So we want to leave space for that. And then, you know, the part that's harder to say, but needs to be said is that because we're going to say yes to those things, that means we're going to say no to a whole lot of other things, things that, you know, might be very righteous, things that are going to be incredibly important to the people who are experiencing them, things that may well be worth another lawyer with another set of skills and a different set of resources litigating, right? But so, I mean, one example because we have had the Pregnancy Discrimination Act for so long, you know, the cases that we had taken under the PDA, which we will now pivot away from, really were limited to a discrete set of circumstances where we thought we could sort of push the envelope on widespread policies we think violate the PDA. Because the PDA, like all Title VII cases, allows for fee shifting. And there are private attorneys that are going to take cases of sort of people who are, you know, fired or otherwise penalized for being pregnant, um, which is a, an enormous problem <laughs> affecting, you know, 50,000, you know, charges with the EEOC in the last decade alone, if you consider that only a very, very small fraction, most people expect sort of single digit percentage of people who experience discrimination file a charge with the EEOC, you can extrapolate to imagine how much pregnancy discrimination is actually occurring in the world, right? But we can't represent all those people. And so where can we as the ACLU really add value? So one example, just in the PDA context has been with points-based attendance policies. So these are policies that essentially say, if you're late for work or absent for any reason, you get a point. And then if you accumulate a certain number of points, you get fired. This is the exact kind of thing that sounds reasonable until you think about what it means to be a pregnant person. Um, and a surprising number of employees have, employers have these policies, typically sort of large retailers with really huge workforces. So it's just a handful of employers that have it, but we think it covers about 11% of the workforce, which is a huge number of people and a huge number of pregnant people, um, people who cannot afford to lose their jobs. And so you know, we've represented a number of women who were fired by AT&T Mobility, which is like the storefront where you go to buy your cell phone um, for accumulating points due to pregnancy, people accumulating points because of morning sickness, accumulating points because they were at the ER overnight, having their fetus monitored. I mean, these are the kinds of things people are getting points for. Meanwhile, you see men having their points written off, you know, for a variety of reasons, and women are told, eh, it's no excuses, right? So those are the kinds of places where we see, look, if we could show that these policies violated the PDA with one strike at the, you know, stroke of the pen, we've now improved the workplace for 11% of the workforce, right? That, that would be a big deal. Spoiler alert, haven't done that yet, right? But if we could, right, that would be a problem worth our taking on as opposed to someone else. And it's the kind of problem someone else might not want to take on because there's not a lot of money in it because these are low wage jobs and it can be difficult to prove, you know, exactly who was fired because of this and because of other reasons. So it's something we feel we're particularly well situated to take on. You know, LDF, the NAACP's Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, was known, particularly in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, for a kind of incremental litigation strategy of building on in small ways on the last victory on the way to, let's say, Brown, um, which was even earlier. Um, and I think in some respects, that's what Justice Ginsburg, or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, before she was justice, was doing too in building a, um, a, a architecture of sex-based equality, rather than trying to bite off the big issue um, out of the gate. In, in your, from what you know of the, of, the, of the women's rights work, whether it's the work that you all have done at the ACLU or elsewhere, 
where else have been there have been good examples of that incremental way of thinking about how to make change um, in the gender justice space? I mean, I think one of Justice Ginsburg's most famous quotes has that word incremental in it, right? It's this whole idea that we're going to make incremental change that people that way people will be more accepting of it. And of course, there's also just a pragmatic piece, which is that you know most most judges are you know in some sense conservative, and I say that with a small c really up until sort of the latest batch of Trump appointees, you know, even Republican appointed judges uh, tended not to want to undo progress uh, in rash ways either, right? It was an incremental gain and an incremental rolling back and sort of this um, this inching. And over time, we hope that we progress forward. And it's only in, you know, the last handful of years, I would say we do see those, you know, like the effort to advance the argument that actually Title IX never prohibited pregnancy discrimination. Like 10 years ago, we would have been laughed out of the gate making that argument. And now suddenly, um, it becomes palatable. That was absolutely her strategy in terms of getting heightened scrutiny under the Equal Protection Clause for gender classifications. But, you know, in some ways, I think it's it's been a good bedrock for the statutory interpretation work as well. You know, the first ever um, sex discrimination Title VII case to make it to the Supreme Court uh, was a case called Phillips versus Martin Marietta. And I mentioned it because Ida Phillips was a, a white woman in Florida who was denied a factory job because she was the mother of school-aged children. And factory's defense was, we love women. Almost everyone who works here is a woman. We just don't like women who have small children at home. And LDF litigated that case, despite the fact it was not a race discrimination case and Ida Phillips was not a Black woman, because they rightly saw that if that's all that it meant, right, if all that's all that sex discrimination means, it has to be like, okay, we've got no women in this place. Being the wrong kind of woman, being a certain kind of woman, right, was an acceptable response, then Title VII would sort of be cut off before it even got started, including in the context of race. And so I think that was the very first Title VII case, and we've sort of built it out from there. If you think about the path from Ida Phillips, you know, to, to Amy Stevens, I see a really clear through line, and I like to think about those connections. That's great. Do you think um, the rule announced by the court in Obergefell would have stuck better, had left less of an immediate and pretty devastating backlash, and including Justice Thomas saying that's next on the list? if we had been a little bit more incremental rather than rushing to get the court's judgment in a, in a, in a much quicker way? It's hard to say, you know, I always, I always like to say judges are people too. And the reality is that people, right, popular opinion shifted on marriage equality much faster, I think, than most folks thought it would. And so in some ways, what we saw in Obergefell is just the court catching up to where people already were and not the other way around. So it's hard to say. It was, I mean, I remember being a child thinking we'll never see this in my lifetime and I'm old, but I'm not that old, you know, and, um, and then we did. So now could there have been a strategy that was aimed at really a more incremental plan of cultural acceptance? Maybe, although, you know, that's a harder one to suggest that anyone should have waited for. Well, that's always the argument is why do you ask people who, whose rights are being denied that they should wait? But you know that was true in the schools context and, and dismantling at least formally Jim Crow. People had to wait. Um, it took time. Um, but I, I think just going back to what you just said, the country as a whole was not as prepared to dismantle Jim Crow as probably we were to recognize same-sex marriages. The stakes were so different um, in some respects. Um, I want to get to the Peltier and um, military case, uh, uh, enlist, not enlistment, registration case. But before I do, I just want to ask you a personal question. When you were in law school, did you expect that you'd be doing this work? No. What would what'd you go to law school to do? Uh, still figuring that out. No, I went to law school. I knew I wanted to do public interest work. Um, I never though was the kind of person who had a particular burning passion. You know, I had so many classmates in law school who knew they wanted to be, you know, an environmental justice lawyer or an abortion rights lawyer or a criminal defense lawyer. I was not that person. Um, I always thought there were, I don't know, a lot of problems out there to be solved and that I could feel happy and fulfilled working on. And um, that was a very scary thing as a law student. And there were no end of people telling me like, you're never getting a job, you know, because my resume was sort of all over the place. I wanted to try out different things. I sort of felt like, isn't that why I went to school in the first place to answer these questions, not to have the answer in my mind. And so 
it was very scary as a student, but I think my career has proved that being peripatetic has actually worked to my advantage because with each experience I've gained, right, the experience I had at LDF, you know, brought me directly to the LGBTQ work and the experience I had in that space brought me directly to the work that I'm doing in the Women's Rights Project. And, you know, I don't know that I'll do women's, women's rights, quotation mark, work forever either, although I hope I never leave the ACLU because I absolutely love working here. But um, there are lots of things that I think I could be happy and fulfilled working on. And to me, the question was more, you know, what kind of job will make me feel happy and fulfilled such that I can continue to do this work in the long term? Because I did direct services work before law school and it was not for me. And I say this as someone who is married to a public defender who would never, ever want to do the work that I do, right? It's not that one is better or more important than the other, but all of us are introverts or extroverts. We thrive in certain ways. We, we, derive energy from certain things and our energy is drained by other things. And I just knew that if I had a job where I was, you know, had to make 72 different phone calls to strangers in a, in a given day that I was going to burn out very quickly and I was not going to be a good advocate and I was not going to be in it for the long haul. And, you know, my one all summer, I interned at the Brennan Center and I just loved it there. And I, it was so eye opening to me, like the fact that people just got paid to go somewhere and like research on Westlaw and write memos, like drink coffee and talk about ideas, you know, like, I came from a middle-class family, but no one in my family had ever had a job like that where you're basically being paid to think about stuff. And that just kind of blew my mind. And I felt like, okay, how can I do this? Like, this is going to make me like, you know, I, I found as I was getting to law school, I would do like the slow walk to the subway. Like, you know, you know, you really don't want to get work. It's like, well, let me stop for a newspaper. It's before newspaper apps. Like, oh, let me stop for a coffee. Oh, I think I really need a bagel. Like you're really dragging, you know? And I was like, I don't want to be doing the slow walk to the subway every day on my way to work, right? Like I need a job where it's like, how can I get there? Let me get there now. I wish I were there now. I'm excited to get there. Monday morning is exciting. So I get students in my office in office hours every week saying, I want to be a public interest lawyer. Should I clerk? Yes. Okay. So say more about that. And, um, and, and what if I need to go to a firm or want to go to a firm, either for financial reasons or to get the training that firms give? can I make my way back to doing public interest work or will they see me as somebody who sold my soul? I think the answer there is also yes, but you have to be thoughtful about it. Um, on clerking, you know, I said, yes, that was a bit pat. I do think it depends maybe what kind of public interest lawyer you want to be and also whether you want to clerk. So I will say at the ACLU, most folks have clerked, I think in the Women's Rights Project, I think at this moment, all but one of our attorneys um, was a clerk. Just again, not to say it's a requirement, but just if you look around at who's there, absolutely people clerk. Some of that is the experience they got from clerking. And some of that is that the kind of person who wants to be an ACLU lawyer is also the kind of person who really wants to be a clerk and who's going to enjoy clerking. So, you know, if you want to be a public interest lawyer, particularly an impact litigator, and you also want to clerk, like, yes, go forward. If you want to be an impact litigator and clerking does not at all appeal to you and you're like, oh, do I really have to do this? You know, no, I don't think you need to collect every gold star possible on your resume, but also know that clerking can be a really fun job. It's incredibly exciting intellectually. Um, you are grappling with, you know, you're learning all these different areas of law you've never knew anything about. You know, in one year, I think in my SDNY clerkship, you know, I worked on a trial involving art fraud and, you know, fake Tiffany windows, you know, a felony gun possession, uh, a trademark dispute involving red sold shoes that Le Bouton filed against Yves Saint Laurent. I mean, just this is one year, right? One year in a clerkship, just incredibly fun and interesting um, and really great skills. And so I, it's actually really fun jobs. So I don't want people to dread it. But if you're like that, if you just heard that and you're like, that sounds really terrible. Also, it's OK, right? You will still get a job if you don't clerk, um, but incredibly valuable. And absolutely, most people at the ACLU have done it. On the firm piece, again, I think the question is just to be really thoughtful and make sure that you're spending your time at the firm getting the skills you're going to need to do the kind of public interest work you want to do. So if you want to be a you know, legal services lawyer, make sure you're working on pro bono where you're representing individuals. If you want to be an impact litigator, you know, don't get on those pro bono projects that involve representing individuals, which often is the easiest kind of pro bono work to get at a firm. So it may take a little bit more effort, right? You want to be the person who's co-counseling with the ACLU or Planned Parenthood, or whatever it is that you want to land. Like we partner with firms on almost all of our cases. We need firms. We don't think there's anything wrong with working at a firm, but you want to be the person who's on that team, who's, you know, making connections so that, you know, when a job comes up, you're the person people say, oh my gosh, let's, Victoria was so great on our case, you know, on that Minnesota case. Let's see if she wants to make a move. That's helpful. Um, okay, Peltier. Um, Galen was here last year when um, Alyssa was a student in the class. 
uh, who is a, was a women's rights um, project uh, lawyer who's now working for Tish James and will be here at the end of the semester. And she talked about, she was, it was right before she did the Fourth Circuit argument. Um, and so we've got a decision there. Um, Archie, I'm gonna ask you to ask the first question around this case, because you wrote very thoughtfully about how that case got set up. You ready? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so while reading the uh, 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 fourth, uh, uh, circuit brief, uh, like a question, like th the first thought that came to my mind was, of course, I understand that here the plaintiffs are people who identify as women and their discomfort with the skirt requirement has nothing to do with their gender identity per se, but uh, about what is getting restricted in the process. It's sort of an instrumental argument to that extent, uh, but while, the, but I, I think like now that it's before the Supreme Court, ultimately like whatever the result is, whether the Supreme Court says that skirting, like this skirt requirement kind of a thing is- she's using, she's using this idea of skirting as opposed to panting, which I thought was really great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so skirting, like it, even if the Supreme Court says that skirting is say unconstitutional, uh, uh, if it says that skirting is unconstitutional only because it uh, uh, restricts women from uh, uh, having the most of school, like be it access to sports, be it uh, uh, like access to, uh, like be, be it the ability to walk around freely, sit freely, et cetera, without any shame or uh, uh, apprehensions. Uh, uh, don't you think that that would result in some violence uh, 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 for two reasons. One is for gender diverse uh, 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 people who not beyond that instrumentality issue, like how skirts can be, a, can be the means of gender expression, skirt or pant in that situation. Also the broader question of how skirting is a gender, regulation which reinforces the gendering process itself that through the skirt and the pants we learn a lot more about gender and internalize a lot more about gender and almost realize what it means to be a woman and a man in the process so do you think that these kind of conversations are important in the legal discourse also like in in, in the reasoning of the supreme court which and if yes or no, what would be your reasons? That's a great question. Um, and before everybody really panics, I did just want to say, you know, the, the cert petition that the school filed is limited to the question whether the, the charter school is a state actor. So in other words, whether charter school students have constitutional rights, which I mean, let's, let's not feel too much relief. I think in many ways, that's actually a more important question because it affects so many students. There are at this moment, 3.7 million students who attend public charter schools, the majority of whom are Black or Latino. Um, I so, edited that out of their reading because I yeah, figured- It's too far afield, but I've just, so in some ways that actually keeps me up awake at night more often. But, you know, I say that only because it's not a coincidence that the school only asked the Supreme Court to review that question. I think they rightly anticipated that they might lose on the merits um, of the skirts rule and just to to walk it back a little bit you know we we tried very much to advance both theories in our brief um so we won our equal protection claim before the district court we had a republican appointed judge in north carolina um and it was actually we galen won right i was not part of the women's right credit team so let's give credit what credit's due it's actually pretty incredible that she managed to pull that rabbit out of a hat um, and get that equal protection win in North Carolina. And the district court's opinion does rely, I think, very heavily on the physical harms to girls of having to wear skirts, right? Which is not the thing, if you read, you know, our clients' declarations and testimony, it's not the thing they were really concerned about. I mean, all of our clients testified, right? It sent the message that I was less than, that I was inferior, that I was not a person whose convenience mattered, you know, that I was a person to be looked at, that I was a person who had to be sort of uncomfortable so that others might be comfortable. So not the primary thing motivating our clients, also a real thing they experienced and something that was much more 
accessible, I think, to our district judge and which ultimately led us um, to prevail on the equal protection claim, which, you know, I think was quite remarkable. At the Fourth Circuit, um, again, in the brief, we tried to do, we tried very hard to do both. And so it's interesting to me to think about the way, you know, you as a reader came away feeling so much more strongly, you know, the one versus the other, um, and, which I think is, is real, you know, and maybe in part because we're all in this room so attuned to uh, not wanting to reinforce the gender binary that any argument that rests on another basis, like, hey, and by the way, our clients were also cold and, you know, they had to crawl around on the floor during fire drills and they couldn't play on monkey bars feels almost ridiculous. We're like, we want to be talking about the binary here. Like, why are we not talking about the binary all the time? Um, and I think that's very real, but we did very much um, try to do both. And I think got some, a uh, couple things we drew a very conservative panel from the fourth circuit. And this is why, you know, to your point about incremental change, right? There is no circuit in the country in which that's not a possibility at this moment in time. And um, certainly not the fourth circuit. Um, we drew uh, two Republican appointed judges, including um, Judge Rushing, who uh, was appointed as a, in her thirties and as a former intern for the Alliance Defending Freedom, um, which is a frequent uh, opponent of the ACLU in court. So I say this just so that you appreciate um, who our audience, we thought our audience might be and who in fact our audience turned to be. And, and even that panel, right? They ruled against us on the state action question, but even those two Republican appointed judges were like, but if this is state action, we really don't think this is okay, but we're not gonna say that for sure because we don't think you've established um, state action here. So, you know, it's hard to say which part of the argument really got through to those judges, but I think the sort of more tangible harms likely a part of it when we tried to do both. Um, is that ultimately, satisfying? Probably not. You know, I think, um, you know, we took aim at the skirts rule because it is, well, first of all, it's the thing that our clients were actually experiencing harm from and, you know, on their own had tried to put an end to. You see in the brief, our client Keely had circulated a petition when she was just in eighth grade, which, I mean, you have to appreciate how amazing our clients are to live in a rural part of North Carolina and sue their school um, as kids and parents. I mean, just incredible strength. Um, so that, right. So it was the real thing that was actually harming them, but you know, the whole dress code, um, is, uh, well, the fact of having a gender specific dress code, of course, enforces the gender binary. And also there are many other aspects of the dress code, um, that could cause problems for people, including rules about makeup and earrings and, and hair. You know, we recently actually just in the last month, um, represented a native American student, um, who wears his hair long um, for traditional and religious purposes and who was subjected to a demand that he cut his hair in order to complete the first grade, which we have staved off for now. Watch this space. So there are a whole bunch of folks at the school that are being harmed by these norms in a variety of ways, gender, race, culture, religion. Um, and ultimately, of course, we would love to see, you know, a gender neutral dress code. The, the way to us, what seems to us the best way to get at it through litigation was a more incremental approach, which is also, sorry, Dan, you're, you're dying to jump in, you know, an advocacy approach, right? Families at the school could demand, we want an all gender dress code. Litigation approach, we're representing specific clients harmed by a specific piece of this. And, um, you know, and, and, and describing that harms in a way that, that are true to them, which of course are not true of all girls or women, you know, cisgender or transgender or LGBT. I mean, I, I mentioned Amy Stevens earlier and I feel compelled to say in the, in the Bostock case, Amy, of course, was the client who was fired for being trans. And one of the objections her employer had was that she actually wanted to wear a skirt to work, right? Her employer also had a sex specific dress code that required women to wear skirt suits. And Amy, uh, who was a binary identified trans woman wanted to, the right to wear a skirt. And of course, in Pelter, we were representing cisgender girls who want the right not to wear a skirt. And right, both of those things obviously were true to who our clients were and to the different ways that they experienced and, and lived their gender. So the question I had was, um, what was the specific relief you were looking for? I can't remember in the complaint. That girls be able to wear both pants or skirts? Yeah. Although, I mean, you know, there's other ways to... Some schools, for example, have dress codes, you know, saying that all students wear pants or shorts, for example. You might have somebody like Amy who could say that was inconsistent with their, uh, you know, gender identity or that they wanted the freedom to wear a skirt. But I do think there are other ways the school could, could fix the problem. Um, there are many ways the school could fix the problem. The most, the easiest, of course, would be to say that girls could opt to wear pants. The next lawsuit presumably would be from a boy, though, who wanted to wear a skirt. Also, 
putting you on the spot. Do you want to say anything about it? Um, I don't know if I have anything to add to that, but that was just something that I that stuck out to me when I was reading. It was kind of like, well, what about boys who want to wear skirts? Um, and I thought that it was. I also touched on the fact that, like, I feel like reading the argument as like a a skirt being sort of like a an oppressive thing to wear. I worried also on the reverse, like about girls who would want to continue to wear skirts and what they would like feel that they were saying like with the statement of continuing to do that so that was kind of like some things I was thinking about it's so interesting and I think I mean some of it goes to like what does it mean to be forced to wear a skirt versus what does it mean to choose to wear a skirt and we all can see I'm wearing a skirt today and I feel great about that uh, but nobody forced me to put it on to come here um, let alone as a condition of receiving my government funded education so I think that you know force piece does a lot of work the interesting thing about boys wearing skirts is you know the fourth circuit actually has some of the most progressive case law in the country about uh, the right of boys to wear long hair to school um, dating from the 1970s, a time when most other courts around the country sort of were really dismissive of claims by boys and men who wanted to wear long hair and sort of thought it was kind of like a hippie fad. And the Fourth Circuit kind of was out there saying, no, actually, every person has the individual freedom to wear their hair long if they choose. And so it's some, in some ways, it's ironic that now we're in the Fourth Circuit. Now, we only have that freedom if we, in fact, have constitutional rights at all, which, remember, that's the threshold question. The Supreme Court might decide. But so there is actually this foundation coming really not so much from a place of gender nonconformity, but just of sort of self-expression um, or, you know, self-actualization dating back to the 70s it's sort of out there. No one's really picked up on it. Um, we did cite some of those cases um, in our advocacy on behalf of the Native student I just mentioned. So it's just another way to think about um, the rights at stake. I will say I'm not a great expert in this area, but I think that's a dress. <laughs> not a skirt. Is it, is it a jumper, though? No, I think it's I a dress. Well, you, only you can say whether it's a jumper. Um, so I remember when Galen was here, I asked her, you know, why didn't you bring a lawsuit that challenged the, you know, the 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 um, the dress code for boys, for girls, for everybody, rather than just for girls? And that was part of what Archie wrote about. So did Victoria, I think, today. Um, and she said we couldn't get clients, boy clients, who wanted to object to that. Can you imagine a way in which the girls who wanted to be able to wear pants would have standing to seek relief for a uh, in the form of a dress code that doesn't require boys or allows boys to wear something other than pants? Mm, so I haven't thought about that particular flavor of the question. So I'm going to cheat and talk about something else while I think more about it. Um, you know, it's funny this question of couldn't find clients because <laughs> this case was filed in 2016 before Trump was elected. I feel compelled to point out. Um, when you think about how long litigation takes and what the likely composition of the Supreme Court was if the issue was going to get there. But now, if you look at, um, you know, there are not a ton of dress code cases percolating in the federal courts, but there are some. And if you look at the cases that are getting litigated, it, it is quite often boys who are seeking the right to wear long hair or earrings, precisely because schools are starting to cave on the other kinds of questions. And so this is sort of the frontier. You know, it's only, you know, seven years later, but now somehow um, those are cases that are moving forward. And It'll be interesting, you know, it's interesting to think about how the search for plaintiffs might have been different, you know, even today than it was then. We certainly thought about the fact that, you know, the skirts rule for the skirts rule for girls is harmful to girls, but it's really harmful to everyone. And so that question, like, could a boy or someone who does not identify as a girl have challenged the skirts rule, I think might have been clearer. I mean, I, I don't know how much of our expert report made it into the brief or that you read, but you know, Dr. Spears Brown had really fascinating research showing, for example, um, the role that skirts requirements played in increasing um, sexual harassment by boys, uh, which is obviously bad for the people who are being harassed. It's also bad for the person who's doing the harassing, right? That they are now internalizing these gender stereotype views about what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman that they've been acting on in ways that are you know, harmful to others and ultimately to themselves. So there is a way in which the skirts rule, which is sort of just the most extreme ma manifestation of the binary identified dress code actually is, is harmful to every student in the school. Easier to do it, I think, in that direction, maybe than the other direction, though, perhaps not impossible. Victoria, you raised some questions about the compare it, the, the, the sort of expectation that when you do equal protection litigation, you use a comparator um, uh, and how that sets up some problems. I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate that this is like a very difficult area and I'm very, I think what you're doing is very, very cool. Um, but what really stood out to me when I was reading this was that 
I feel like the the like closest argument at hand for using an EPC argument is basically having a group A and using that one as a baseline of saying, okay, are you being negatively impacted as compared to this group A? And somehow reading this, it just stands up to me that group A is generally always like men, you know, like or people that are have been grouped into this idea of what male expression is. And that is always like the highest thing. That's always like the normal thing. And whatever this expression group is doing is always going to be the normal one. Just like an anecdotal thing, I'm from Sweden. And when I was in high school, a couple of my guy friends, when it was super hot outside, um, they just came in skirts to school. And they were like, yeah, you know, it's breezy in my Nida regions. But like, and we were like, yeah, sure. Because we didn't have like a dress code, right? And for... I don't know, for me, just reading this also from, from my side, like I like to wear skirts too when it's very hot outside. Um, and obviously you were doing the cold argument here, which is also true. But is, I guess like my question for this one is, is this a very, um, is this a very deliberate um, way of just saying, okay, but we are choosing to just s cementing this group A of being male expression because we need to do the incremental change part. Is that like a very, um, do you have like, you know, a longer plan of moving beyond that later? Or is this something that, you know, you have to do for to, to do like an EPC argument? So it's such an interesting question because I feel like, um, you know, the brief you think you're writing and the brief that other people are reading are not necessarily the same thing. And so I, I love this. I feel like we need like a focus group. We need like a focus group of brief readers. Um, exactly. Move the brief, um, which, you know, you kind of do, but don't really do. Um, so I love hearing um, the different threads that you all were able to pull out of the brief that we're all reading the same thing and taking away so many different messages from it. It's just fascinating. And I, I'm going to continue to think about this after um, the conversation. The reason I mentioned that is because, you know, to us, we thought we were really making a very individualized argument compared to other equal protection cases that had already been decided. And so maybe this is sort of a, a boring way of saying, yes, it was incremental. But, you know, the cases that we were contending with were cases like Hayden or perhaps Jesperson, where the court has expressly said, no, no, what we're going to do and deciding whether something is discriminatory is we're going to compare group A and group B. And if group A overall is not worse off than group B overall, then we don't see a problem. And what we were trying to do was really move the needle and say, actually, that's the wrong way to think about it. We're going to look at these individual members of our group and consider whether they are being disadvantaged because of their membership in group A, um, which is not nearly as ra radical of an argument as one that could be made, but was actually quite different um, from the argument that we had seen courts of appeals previously accept. I mean, Jesperson you know, which of course involves involved a casino dress code that required women uh, to wear makeup. Um, personal best. Personal best, yeah. We're all our best when we're make, wearing makeup for women. Um, personal best policy, you know, for years has sort of been out there as the leading court of appeals decision on, on dress codes and employers have cited it over and over again. Even the EUC has pointed to it and saying, well, yeah, it's generally fine. And so, you know, that's the legal landscape we're living in. And when I said earlier, right, we're looking at the legal problem, I think some of... Um, these threads of conversation also relate to, right? I'm looking at the legal problem we're facing, Jesperson, and you're looking at like, what is the real experience of being a student in this school? And what problems is the gender binary creating there? And, and those are both very real problems and they don't maybe don't always, you know, perfectly align. So it's interesting to think about that kind of disconnect or the space between those two experiences. You may know this better than I do, but I seem to remember that the issue of cost of makeup versus no makeup um, in Jesperson actually wasn't briefed. It was something the court kind of invented itself as a way to say, oh, the, oh, there'll be discrimination if the differentiation imposes a financial burden on group A that group B doesn't have to bear. Um, and, and that sometimes happens that the courts come up with some goofy reason to decide the case that you were not aware was going to be what they were going to be doing. I don't know. It is, do you remember that that was the case? And have you ever had that happen in any of your own litigation? So I didn't remember that. Um, Jesperson is one of these cases. Like every time you read it or think about it, you notice something you didn't notice in the previous reads. Of course, now I feel I want to go back and reread Jesperson, um, even though we're successfully, um, you know, moving it into the dustbin of history. Um, has that ever happened in terms of uh, a basis that you totally didn't think of? I want to think more on that. 
nothing. I don't, I don't have like a great anecdote that comes to mind, like the deaf person one, apparently, but it's not to say like, we're so brilliant. We always thought of things, but you know, judges for the most part are people too, um, who get briefs and arguments and who rely on them. Often you'll get questions and argument that maybe weren't how you thought something was going to be decided. And that kind of obviously is a tip off. That's where they're going, but I'll have to think if I have a good story for you. So if I do, I agree that the state action question is hugely important given how much we've privatized public education and the uh, racial and class impact of having done something like this here in Harlem and every corner is a charter school. Um, we basically have no public educational system in the northern part of Manhattan. Um, uh, we do have public schools. They are public charter schools. Definitely. Thank you. Some of them, you know, around the country are now religious. Not yet. Schools. Not yet. I don't know. Liz Sepper's work on this has shown that there are a few in Texas already. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Anyway, they're planning it. So bad guys. Yes, they are planning it. And they're, yes, actively putting in applications and seeding, seeding them up. So what comes after um, dress codes in terms of the, the kinds of issues that you might prioritize should you win the state action argument and are able to go after some of these um, privately run, publicly funded um, institutions that, you know, the beauty of them like segregation academies in the, in the 50s and 60s is that they could, they could kind of hold parochial local values with public funding. Um, uh, that that violate what what would otherwise be public norms around equality or just basic education. I do feel compelled to tell you. So the on banc argument, um, which Galen also completely crushed, um, but the on banc argument involved many uncomfortable questions for opposing counsel about what it might mean if the charter day school was not in fact a public school. And uh, opposing counsel was asked a series of questions of, you know, could they do this or could they do that? So it started, you know, could they prohibit students from wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War? Facts of Tinker, Mary Beth Tinker, another ACLU client, answer yes. Could they seat black students at the back of the classroom and prohibit them from participating in classroom discussion? Well, they'd never do that, but could they do it? Well, the state would revoke their charter, but would it violate section 1983? No. Right. So and it just went from there. And at some point they essentially said, well, that's just so outrageous. The state would shut it down. And Judge Harris said, suppose I think what you're doing is so outrageous. What you're doing right now is so outrageous and no one has shut it down. Right. No one is going to shut this down. And so it, it's right there waiting for you. And of course, you know, the reality uh, is that we do have statutory protections, although they are not complete um, in some spaces like Title IX for sex discrimination or Title VI for race discrimination. There's a whole lot of constitutional uh, freedom though in the schoolhouse context that's maybe not protected by statute. So the First Amendment um, was a great example. School discipline and searches is another um, example that readily comes to mind, right? What would it mean if there's no due process protections for students when they are searched at school? Um, that's really actually quite terrifying and there's not going to be a federal or state law protection from discrimination that's going to swoop in in the way that, you know, Title IX might. The other piece I'll say about dress codes is, you know, the, the um, bank decision on Title IX, you know, so we won our argument that Title IX applies to dress codes. In other words, dress codes aren't totally exempt from Title IX. And this is another great example of incremental. Everybody's like, yeah, obviously. No, actually, we had a district court decision saying dress codes are categorically exempt from Title IX. Title IX doesn't apply at all. And so getting that first circuit court ruling that says, no, actually, you can't discriminate when it comes to dress codes was a huge win. What we have not yet done is gone back to the district court and actually proved, as we, I think, are required to do under the en banc decision, that a skirts rule, in fact, is discrimination in a dress code, right? So that's a very obvious next step. And it's interesting, as I said, to think about what other gender-based policies, you know, may be on the chopping block now that we sit here in 2023 and not 2016. You know, also this year we filed uh, in the employment context a, a complaint on behalf of a, a non-binary flight attendant who similarly was sort of objecting to a binary dress code. Um, and, you know, the the airline's initial response to our demand letter was to change from the male kit and the female kit to the masculine kit and the feminine kit, 
and say, well, your client is free to choose the masculine kit or the feminine kit. And we said, but the whole problem is our client is not masculine or feminine. They're non-binary. That's how this works. Yeah. It's kind of the definition, what it is to be non-binary. Um, and, you know, then we uh, had to file a complaint uh, with the State Civil Rights Commission. Um, and that challenge is moving forward. Um, so, you know, there are already people now, I think, you know, would that same client have been willing to stand up in 2016? You know, I don't know. It's a different world now in 2023. And, you know, to have someone who's willing to publicly say like, yeah, I'm a non-binary flight attendant and I can't wear either of these kits, or I need to be able to mix and match from these kits to dress in a way that's authentic to who I am. And you have a rule that says like, it's just so ridiculous. Like, can't wear a tie with lipstick. I don't know. I'm making this up, but like, I'm like people wear ties with lipstick all the time. Like what's going to somehow, what's going to happen? The plane's going to crash. Um, but so these cases are out there and some of them even are cases that we're taking on, um, as time, you know, marches forward and, and norms change and, um, and people are willing to say, you know, Hey, this is a problem. And as you can see from that case, right, it's different from the skirts case in the sense that there is no remedy that would fix the harm that our client is experiencing other than to abolish the masculine kit and the feminine kit. And that's just not true for our clients in the skirts case, though it might be true for other students at that same school. Well, in this sense, Bostock's a problem, right? That it it it, it imagines a world of Kinsey ones and Kinsey sixes and, um, uh, and, and has been not particularly useful for people who don't identify as entirely heterosexual or entirely homosexual. It could be bisexual, asexual, whatever. But the kind of logic game that Justice Gorsuch plays in Bostock, where he's swapping out the object choice of, uh, uh, particularly in the sexual orientation context, um, locks you into that binary in ways that could also pose a problem in terms of the, the, non, the non-binary gender identified person too. I don't know that I read Gorsuch's opinion in the same way. I mean, I think if you take the logic of sort of this, the definitional question of can you define this term without using, you know, man, woman, male, female, insert synonym of choice, right? The logic works, works when it comes to pregnancy, right? Works when it comes to being non-binary, right? How do you define being non-binary without any reference to any sort of sex or gender coded, coded word? I think you can't, you know, the same is true, certainly of what it means to be bisexual. So I don't, I think the decision's maybe a bit more capacious than, than you do. I guess time will tell, but I think that question really focused on the individual. Like, can you define this individual's experience of discrimination without talking about any of these protected things? And I just think the answer to that question is going to be no when it comes to like the whole range of people you just mentioned. I guess we will see. We'll have you come back and you can see who's, who, who's reading a Bostock um, has had more purchase with a conservative court. Um, I think about Tennessee and this new drag, uh, anti-drag law that they just passed. Um, challenging that law would fall in the jurisdiction of the Women's Rights Project or the LGBT HIV Project? Great question. Could be either. Um, could also be, um, gosh, all these things sometimes also fall in our sort of speech privacy technology sense in, this, in the sense that, you know, it's a, it's a form of expression, how we dress. Um, yeah. And it's a bit artificial sometimes how we divvy up the work among these. I mean, I feel compelled to say that in addition to having an LGBTQ project and a women's rights project, we also have a reproductive freedom project. So there are at least three projects within our national legal department that are, you know, expressly focused on various forms of gender discrimination. Um, and just specializing in those ways. And sometimes we all work together and sometimes um, we parse them different ways. The place where we've worked, I would say most often with the LGBT project, well, varies. Um, we've partnered, for example, on cases on behalf of trans women or girls. Um, yeah. Okay, military. Why the heck did you bring that case? Why have the military be the new frontier, or at least re- revisiting of an old frontier of sex-based equality? Why, why not, Catherine? Um, no, this is a great question. Um, a couple of things. One, we, we did not, in fact, file this case. We joined this case as co-counsel um, at the CERT stage. And that's significant because this was a case that the Fifth Circuit had already decided a CERT petition was going to be filed. And it seemed to us quite possible the Supreme Court was in fact going to grant cert in the case. And so as the Women's Rights Project, the notion that the Supreme Court might consider the, you know, 
really the most significant equal protection gender claim since possibly VMI. I mean, maybe uh, Morella Santana question, but arguably the most important sex discrimination equal protection case in 25 plus years. And we were not going to be in it. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, just absolutely too important. Um, in part, when you look at how useful VMI has been, I mean, VMI itself, also a case that sort of touches on the military. Obviously, VMI is not itself the military, but it's a military academy. And yet it is, you know, one of, if not the most cited case by the Women's Rights Project and virtually every issue that we work on. There's so much in there um, about gender and about sex stereotyping, about what's permissible. Um, and so, you know, this case had the court taken it. Um, I thought, you know, rightly or wrongly, but I thought, you know, could be the next VMI in that sense, right? Could be the court's next opportunity to really reflect on what does unconstitutional gender discrimination look like. And with a newly reconstituted court under President Trump, there were real concerns, right, that there might be huge, huge, huge walk back uh, of the application of heightened scrutiny, even in the places where it's, you know, relatively uncontested, which does not include dress codes or the military, by the way. So, you know, the fact that we ended up getting you know, Justice Kavanaugh to sign on to the statement from Justice Sotomayor really, I think, you know, relieved some concerns that this court was, you know, eager, at least right out of the gate, to roll back the application of heightened scrutiny or to suggest that heightened scrutiny didn't, doesn't really sort of mean what it says. But the military. Some of the Women's Rights Project's earliest cases involve the military, and the military is one of those places, because you essentially live at work, virtually every aspect of your life is regulated. And so all of these social norms and customs and stereotypes are actually written down and codified um, in ways that can be challenged, but that reflect, I think, broader social norms. So the first case that RBG ever argued before the United States Supreme Court was Frontiero, which of course involved Sharon Frontiero, the service woman who was denied a housing allow allowance that she would have been entitled to you know, automatically had she been a man. Not a coinc coincidence that case happens in the military because where else do you have the government, right? weighing in on these details of who we live with, um, whether or not we carry a pregnancy while working. Captain Susan Strzok, RBG's client, um, who is a captain in the Air Force um, and was fired for carrying her pregnancy to term, uh, the Air Force wanted her to have an abortion. Ultimately, they walked back that policy. But again, not a coincidence, this is all happening in the military, which is a place where so many aspects of our lives are regulated and the government has the opportunity really to codify sex stereotypes. The military also holds this sort of magical space as um, kind of a microcosm of inclusion and exclusion in American life of the status of who's in, who's out. There was a wonderful amicus brief filed in support of our petition by uh, the Modern Military Association of America, which advocates for LGBTQ inclusion um, and other groups essentially laying out that history of uh, integration across a range of characteristics, race, gender, bringing us through to the trans-military ban, right? So all of these ways, who's in and who's out in the military sort of reflect these broader social norms about who's fit to serve and who is considered sort of unacceptable or unworthy. For this reason, men-only registration, despite the fact that there has not been a draft since the 70s, actually it was one of the top priorities of many service women's groups, um, which is surprising, uh, but they all felt sort of much like the skirts, right? The fact that we don't have to register and they do sends a message that we are inferior, that we are not as good, and that creates, you know, a culture of a culture that can be really toxic to women, including um, a culture of sexual harassment and violence that, you know, military women, many military women think uh, is expressly linked to men only registration for the draft. So those are some of the reasons. Tasha, you talked about some of the political backstory of these uh, yeah, sure. I was uh, surprised that uh, Justice Sotomayor was the one who wrote the statement because she didn't have to. Um, and especially who signed on with her and her reasoning for not granting cert. I was just very surprised by all of it um, because she basically states that, OK, look, Congress is considering this. Let's not touch it, which is not something the court has cared about before because they've done this a million other times. Um and I just found it to be a very superficial reason. I just don't think they want to touch, she wanted to touch the military because of her colleagues. I think that it's as simple as that. I think it was a political reason and it has nothing to do with separation of powers because if they really cared about separation of powers and, you know, stare decisis, they wouldn't have done Dobbs. They wouldn't have done a million other things. So I just thought it was very all superficial. Um, and interestingly enough, I used the VMI case to try an analogy between VMI and Piter, the Catholic school skirt case, 
because that was also a school that had a pretty stupid gender policy and they had no empirical data saying that women couldn't do this. And the court was like, yeah, you can't do this. You have no empirical data. This doesn't serve any purpose. And having women here is not going to is not going to have the school like shut down or anything. So I actually drew an analogy between that case and the skirt case, even though it's a military case, technically. So, yeah, um, I don't know if I have a question, but that, that's my opinion. Um, I'll just say on this statement, you know, the, the thing that I think the court didn't want to do, right, was was order women to register. And I feel compelled to point out that that was actually not only was that not the relief we were seeking, it was actually not on the table. So close readers of the petition may have noticed that, you know, the district court had granted um, a declaratory injunction saying men only registration is unlawful, but had declined to enter an injunction essentially saying Congress have, well, it's gonna have to come up with a constitutional way to fix this. You could have everyone register. You could have no one register. There are lots of ways you can do it. I'm going to defer to them on the right way to fix it. But what I do know is that you can't do this because this discriminates based on sex. Um, and the government appealed the declaratory injunction. The plaintiffs who became our clients later did not appeal the denial of the injunction. So the only relief that was on the table before the Supreme Court was a declaration that men only registration was unlawful, which then would have put the call ball back in Congress's court, which of course is exactly what the justices in their statements say they wanted to do, but would have been the effect um, had we prevailed. And so the idea that somehow we needed Congress to choose opt a remedy. I mean, I think the, the political, there is no political will to extend registration. So the practical effect I think would have been to, you know, end registration for everyone, which um, is, a, is an outcome that we at the ACLU would, would welcome. We oppose conscription for people of any gender, um, but to the extent there is a draft, um, we think it shouldn't be implemented in a discriminatory way. Interestingly enough, you know, the idea of using gender discrimination to end registration for the draft, of course, was the exact strategy used in, in Rosker. And, you know, we talk about Rosker. Rosker's decided as a sex discrimination case, but the plaintiffs in Rosker, also represented by the ACLU, another plug, you know, had a whole bunch of theories. It kind of threw everything at the wall. This was at the time when men were actively being drafted or feared being drafted. And so these were people who did not want to be conscripted. And you know, they had a due process theory and they had an involuntary servitude theory and a um, whole bunch of other things that I'm sure I'm forgetting. There were like six or seven constitutional theories. And, you know, the sex discrimination theory was the one that stuck. Um, and it was the one that ultimately got them relief in the district court, although, of course, the United States Supreme Court overturned it. So this idea that, you know, using the fact that only some people are subject to something bad to end the bad thing for everyone actually really was uh, the same approach taken by the the plaintiffs in Rosker and you know, really the clients in the, in the selective service case who were men who, you know, were pacifists and did not want to be called up. There is, P.S., a case um, in the District of New Jersey involving a woman who is seeking the right to register, which is sort of another way of getting at it. Um, we're not involved in that case, though, of course, we're watching it. That's such an interesting strategy to use gender or race or other forms of discrimination as an abolitionist project knowing that courts would be so disinclined to make that institution more equal. They actually be, they're more invested in their sexism than they are in militarism. Um, of course, this was my view about Obergefell, is that the way to solve that problem was to disestablish the institution of marriage. Not a particularly popular view in the gay community, but that would be one way to solve it. And it was actually argued from the bench in the Prop 8 case in, in California was the judge said one of the judges during the oral argument said, well, we could solve this problem by just getting the state out of the marriage business. And the, I think it was Mary Bonanno who was arguing that case, said, no, 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 no. We want marriage. We want a lot of marriage. Um, so that's not the relief they were looking for, but it would solve the problem. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, let's open it up to other folks who are on call today who are um, interested in these topics. We've got some qu question or comment. What's uh, We've been yakking for way too long. Laura? Um, yeah, I had a question. Thank you very much for speaking today. I had a question kind of getting at these like legal structures which kind of evade laws, like you were talking about charter schools. In the employment context, I guess that might be more and more workers or contract workers, which evades all these sorts of regulations. How does that impact the gender space? And how do you see going forward with this larger and larger percentage of the population being contract workers? 
Um, I love this question. And it's a problem we've tried to get at, although not successfully yet. So I welcome your thoughts and suggestions. Um, no, it's a huge problem. So I mean, it's not just contractors, it's franchise workers, it's gig workers, it's domestic workers, right? There's actually a huge, huge number of workers that are sort of cut out of this category of employee, right? They do that only employees have rights or rather the way the law usually thinks about it, only employers can be held accountable for violating people's rights. And then who is an employer and who is an employee? So, you know, the case where we most recently challenged this um, involved a McDonald's franchise um, that we sued for sexual harassment in our, but our theory, you know, in the case involved extremely distressing facts of rampant sexual harassment at this franchise restaurant. But our point was, you know, if you want to fix sexual harassment at McDonald's, it's not enough to just go after the franchise. You have to get corporate on the hook because nothing is ever going to change in McDonald's franchise unless corporate wants it to change. We all know that's true, right? They can dictate exactly how many pickles you put on a burger. They could also do something about sexual harassment if they wanted to, and they just don't care. Um, so we sued the franchise restaurant, but also McDonald's corporate on a joint employer theory, um, which we lost, which, you know, was not at all surprising. The case law on joint employer is absolutely terrible um, and has also been the subject of, you know, flip-flop, uh, both administrative rulemaking and uh, executive decision-making. So, you know, the Obama administration issued, you know, relatively broad joint employer rules, and then the Trump administration walked it back, and now Biden's taking it back in the other direction, which, you know, meanwhile, every four years, the same people are still working in these jobs, right? And it's like, you have rights. No, you don't. Now you do. No, you don't. Um, so, you know, we had hoped that a court ruling might lead to relief that was a bit more durable than what we've seen um, folks get through the executive branch. Um, but, you know, we'll keep pressing this theory, and I, I think I love that you honed in on it because I think it really is one of the places where here's a here's a legal problem that is capable of a legal solution that we maybe actually you know could get um, and would make a difference for just a huge 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 number of workers, um, including many women and especially you know black women and low income women. I actually do have a question. Um, in my paper, I also talked about um, at least the Supreme Court's cases regarding education. There has been no right to education. There's no right to literacy, even though some state constitutions are trying to make that happen. But at the federal level, there's no right to it, even though many school districts, many students, many public schools sue for different type of rights of students. But the Supreme Court has recognized that there's no right to education. There's no right to um, funding. There's also no right to a certain level of education. There just needs to be efforts made and there's also no right to protect students in schools. So what right do students have, if any? Great question. Um, and, you know, I'll say, well, I'll say this. So many of those cases really were litigated through the, expressly through the lens of race or poverty. And, you know, the Supreme Court has made clear ever since Brown too, that it had no interest in actually enforcing um, or creating integrated schools um, or requiring schools that did not have resources, right? Requiring states or localities provide more resources to schools that lacked resources because where were the resources gonna come from except for the places that already have resources, right? Places where people don't wanna give up resources. So although I am perhaps a realist and a pessimist when it comes to the court's interest in desegregating schools, or has shown it's profoundly uninterested in desegregating schools, I would add Millican v. Bradley to your list, right? The case that said you can't order an integration remedy across a metro area, city and county. So it allowed uh, white flight in Detroit essentially to permanently segregate the schools there. Of course, you don't need to move to the suburbs to do that. Here in New York City, we have the most segregated school system in the nation and we all live right next to each other, but we've managed to figure it out anyway. This is all deeply distressing. That said, <laughs> um, there are other places where, you know, we we hope or think we can have um, more of a toehold. And this goes back to the question of like, but where's the problem and where's the problem that we can win, right? So one of the arguments we made on behalf of the native student we just represented, of course, was that the requiring him to cut his hair and fringe on his religious liberty, an argument that maybe we could have won, by the way, also happened to be true. Um, when we think about student searches and seizures, seizures very distressing. On the other hand, you know, even some of the more conservative or libertarian justices have expressed real concern about, you know, government overreach or Fourth Amendment violations. Um, and so, you know, making that a reality in the school's context, again, is a place where I think, you know, we could get a toehold if the skirts question, you know, made its way to the court directly. And, you know, it isn't in our case, but 
you know, if if they deny cert this time, it certainly could be after we prevail, maybe on on Title IX. Um, you know, I think that's that too is a question we could win. Is it everything? No, of course not. Would it still make a huge difference? Yes, I think so. I hope so. Otherwise, we're really in the wrong line of business. Um, so this is taking back uh, the conversation a little bit to the military cases. Uh, uh, so the like my question is based on the observation that authoritarian regimes across the world have regularly pink washed the discourse to sort of provide a positive spin to their militarization, Israel being one of the biggest examples. So female fighter pilots have been uh, 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 celebrated as like a great gender justice uh, uh, project. So now in that overall context and the context that the US military is a global nightmare, uh, probably the biggest one, uh, do you think like any sort of resources spent on equalizing the military, which in the broader scheme would necessarily have the impact of marginalizing some people, including marginal women, is sort of like a misplaced gender justice project, irrespective of its immediate gains? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you know, as I said, I, I don't think it was really squarely presented in our case because the effect of our case actually would have been to abolish registration, but it certainly has come up in other ACLU cases, including most recently our challenge, the trans military ban, you know, which was heavily criticized for exactly the reason that you just articulated, which is like, why do you want into this institution at all? Um, and, you know, we had real answers to those questions, you know, that turned on many of our clients who, many of whom had grown up uh, in very low income or under-resourced households and had, you know, no other avenue. And, and your answer, of course, there are answers to those. I'm not saying those are sufficient answers. Th those were the answers that we had, um, as well as this question about sort of um, just broader inclusion, right? The military, for better or worse, is this institution that reflects um, our status in the country. And it's a profound thing to be told, you know, you're in or you're out, which the same was true of marriage. And then Again, which then I think is is subject to the same response, right? Enslaved people were also not allowed to marry. Um, so it's it's been a long struggle over the history of our nation of trying to get included in these institutions that perhaps we might be better off without. Um, but nonetheless, we filed Loving v. Virginia and we filed the transmilitary ban case and we challenged registration. But I think the critiques you raise are are very real, and you know we will certainly continue to uh, to hear them. And as I said, I, we have answers, but I don't know they're wholly satisfying. Gordon? Hi again. Um, you mentioned before sort of your perspective on the changing behavior of the Supreme Court, to put it lately. Um, and you've also talked about how you've had to strategize like towards what you see as like a winnable argument. So I'm curious what your sort of strategy changes or different approaches have had to be sort of in the wake of this new, um, some might call it like extremist core and I'm wondering what is sort of like the I guess they like the ethos or approach like that your team now has to take um in the face of like a court that's turning back a lot of what's been going forward yeah, it's a great question I mean I will say on some level the question feels largely academic to now because the truth is we're still litigating cases we filed in 2016 and beyond which is right the thing about litigation is you file cases and then you're committed to them for you know, years or decades out. And meanwhile, the world around you changes, right? Not just the court, but the world changes. Like your point about Galen saying we couldn't get boys long here to challenge it. Like they're, trust me, they're there now, right? They're everywhere now, but the world has changed since we filed the case. The court has changed. A lot of things has, have changed. And, you know, now you've made a commitment to represent certain people and you have to see it through till the end. The other piece of it is that this court, although absolutely devastating in, in new ways in some frontiers has really, you know, as I said, it's never been great for pregnancy. It's never been great across the majority of the issues the ACLU works on. We have 14 uh, project-based areas, including capital punishment, <laughs> including immigration, including national security, right? These are all areas where the court historically over our 100 year existence has mostly been terrible and we have often lost. So in some sense, that's not new. And while that may feel bleak, I actually, it actually gives me a great amount of hope to know that, right? The answer can't be that we that we give up or that we stop trying, um, we're going to find ways, um, even if it's, you know, an act of resistance or it's a form of harm reduction, we're going to find a way forward. 
Then there's also the reality is the court doesn't seem all that interested in most of the issues that we in the Women's Rights Project work on with some notable exceptions, but you know, that court kind of doesn't care about us. And there's a sense in which that could work to our advantage, right? Because there are some issues that I think we can litigate in the lower courts that we're winning in the lower courts that the Supreme Court is not particularly likely to take a look at. So just to name one example, you know, it's all, we all know that in the employment context, sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination, not so under the Fair Housing Act. Um, it's something most circuits have not considered and we are still fighting to establish. Am I hugely worried the Supreme Court is going to take that question? No, I don't think they care, frankly. Uh, but that's a good thing um, because we can win and we are winning in the circuit. So there are also places where I think we can continue to litigate um, and get victories that are more likely to stand than not. What about the state courts? So we've just launched a new state courts initiative. I'm so glad you asked. Um, we just hired two lawyers uh, to run a new state courts initiative at the ACLU National and I'll just say, you know, our ACLU affiliates have always done a ton of state court litigation, but in the national office, we've been much less focused on state courts um, to our detriment, I think. And so this is an effort really to be thoughtful about that um, and to change it. And we're starting in the Women's Rights Project. I would say we've not been as um, on the vanguard as my colleagues in the Reproductive Freedom Project, who've already filed, I think, over a dozen state court cases challenging abortion bans, um, but we are getting there. So, you know, for example, um, one of the issues that we have in recent years been looking at much more closely is family regulation system to pull up on JMAC. And of course, those issues largely do get litigated in state courts. Um, and so if you're waiting for the, you know, the family court case to end and to bring some affirmative challenge in, in federal court, you can be waiting a long time and often, uh, quite often after the harm is done. So there are particular places um, where we're thinking about state courts, not so much because we're afraid of the federal courts, though maybe we also are, but just because that is where the harm is happening. And for too long, we haven't thought about these problems as gender justice issues. We haven't thought about them as sort of real problems on par with the other problems that the ACLU National Legal Department litigates. And uh, we're trying to change that. Um, and that's gonna require going where the problems are happening. And that's you know family court, housing court, all these things that are happening um, in state courts where women find themselves subject to government surveillance, um, which are not the same places that men are surveilled. Um, it looks like there are some questions on the Zoom, I noticed, but also building off of Jordan's question, um, what about losing? Do you view losing as a productive, like strategic choice, um, maybe as a, a version of incremental change or as a pathway to creating openings for productive appeal? I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I wouldn't know I would describe it as like a, a choice I would want to make, um, but it's a reality that we all have to confront. And I think, you know, you're right to be thinking smartly about how to lose and how to lose forward. People still say, how, how do you lose forward? Or how do you lose in a way where you've created momentum um, for something better to happen? So, you know, that might be, for example, you know, had we lost uh, the Bostock cases, many people thought, though that would be terrible, that that would create the political momentum needed in Congress to pass the Equality Act momentum we have not seen. I don't know whether or not that would have happened, but it's one possibility. And it certainly is a moment that many folks, you know, would have would have used to sort of seize on to as this kind of outrageous decision, so out of step with where people are, and now we need to fix it. Um, and certainly that's happened before. I mean, I talked about the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, great example of Congress being like, court, you got it so wrong. Um, and we are so outraged by it that we are actually going to do something about it, despite the fact that we seem to be not able to do a whole lot about any problems facing Americans. Um, so I think there's that strategy. And then there's also the like, how do you create, you know, the dissent of today that's going to become the majority opinion of tomorrow? And you know, it's tough to wait, but there is a way in which, um, it's a profound thing to be heard and to be seen by the Supreme Court, even in dissent, certainly preferable to not being seen at all. And I think many of us listening to Justice Jackson's question this term have felt really seen um, by her um, just radical truth speak telling about what the 14th Amendment is really about. And do I think that those views are going to be in a majority opinion? No, of course, nobody expects that. Will it nonetheless be transformative to see them come from a sitting member of the United States Supreme Court? Yes. Will I think she, you know, win the day in the long run, you know, yes, of course. And so I think there's value in that too. And, and just remembering, right? Like people at the time knew this was wrong because people will look back in the future and be like, well, that was just the standard of the time. Like, no, no, it was not, right? And there were people out there 
uh, like Justice Jackson um, or Justice Harlan, you think about his dissent in Plessy, right? Like people knew in 1896 that this was wrong. They sure did, you know, and um, we're going to hold them. We're going to hold them to that. And so I think there's a really important role for dissents as well. So for those of you who are asking questions on Zoom, I'm going to go to the questions in the room first. And if we have time, we'll, we'll go to yours as well. Um, Isaac. Thank you for being with us today. Um, off of that question, I'm sort of thinking about the the whole theory of your line of work is that litigation itself makes a difference and matters. And one of the key things to making that theory a reality is access to the court system in the first place. So how do you think about litigating issues of access? I suppose I'm thinking here of like the Supreme Court's recent restriction of standing and just disability doctrines. To Juliana's point, the case Juliana, oddly named, um, you know, was a loss, but also opened up a whole vista of environmental challenges um, and can be read in that way as a win. So when you're parsing through finding plaintiffs, litigating the issues, how front of mind are these access questions? And um, do you ever find small victories in those as well, I guess, is sort of what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's a great question. Um... I guess I, you know, I quibble a little bit maybe with the premise, which is that we're trying to get people access to courts. I, I think what we're, what the project here, question whether it's working, but the project, right, is that like Supreme Court decisions or statutes that are passed by Congress are actually going to change social norms about what it means to sort of live in this country. And they're actually going to change people's behavior. So we are not, for example, going to fire people for being pregnant in the first place. Not that when that happens, we'll have a way to remedy it. Although, of course, if it happens, we will remedy it. But the thing that we are really trying to do, right, is to change the behavior on the front end. And so that ideally means, right, nobody needs access to counsel. But of course, we all know they do. Um, these kind of threshold questions about standing and judiciability, you know, come up in, I was going to say funny place, like they, they crop up, right? And it's absolutely part of the job. I mean, in some ways, the state action question in Peltier felt that way. It was, you know, of course, it was always a part of the case. It was always something we knew we'd have to prove. But the idea that the question that would be at the Supreme Court front and center was really a, a threshold question of, you know, do these students even have rights or is this entity even one that can be sued under the statute? You know, it's certainly not why anyone of us in the Women's Rights Project come to work, but nonetheless, you know, it becomes hugely important. We're briefing a jurisdictional question now, too, in one of our Pregnancy Discrimination Act cases. We were just directed by the 11th Circuit to brief this question of whether the district court even had jurisdiction over uh, what we filed which again, you know, not why we got into this pregnancy discrimination fight, but a question that I think will be hugely important, whether other litigants like her, you know, have the ability to try and vindicate their rights. So not something that we necessarily have, I think, focused on as a strategic priority area in the way that like we have plans for women's rights work, you know, plans for racial justice work, um, but something that sort of crops up, it's transubstantive, it pops up across our work. And it's one of the places where I think being a multi-issue organization can really help. I mean, our our briefing and our thinking about the state action question is just hugely informed by the fact that like every part of the ACLU uses section 1983, many parts of the ACLU much more frequently than we do because we've got a whole lot of statutes that prohibit sex discrimination that we uh, are often litigating under and a lot of other folks don't. Um, so that can be really helpful as well. But no, it's huge to think about, you know, the, the thing that may end up being most important about your case is this uh, procedural piece of it. Funny story on that, a case that our uh, national legal director, David Cole, won before the United States Supreme Court is called Le LeBron v. Amtrak. And this was a case involving an artist who um, sought to uh, post a controversial painting, sort of a faux ad he did about, it was like the Nicaraguan Contra, as like I'm dating, dating this case here, um, in, the, in Penn Station, in the giant ad in Penn Station. And um, it's a First Amendment case. And David Cole's like this great First Amendment lawyer, right? And I guess the Supreme Court, basically the question on is Amtrak the government such that you've got constitutional rights at all? And also, was this was the argument that Amtrak was the government waived because it wasn't argued properly in the Second Circuit? And the thing that case is most cited for now is this question about this idea that you can only waive claims but not legal theories, right? So LeBron, David's great gift to the world in LeBron, but it's actually hugely important. It's hugely important. We rely on it all the time, right? You always, you've got a claim, you can advance any legal argument in support of that claim, even if you never thought of it before the moment you stood up before a court, right? So hugely important, absolutely not what he set out to do when he filed that case on behalf of Michael LeBron. Um, but that's just how things work out sometimes. You guys, I think you had your hand. Thanks so much for being here. I, 
you, you talked a bit before about how the military is the space where the government has so much control over people's lives and how it's sort of this site for a lot of litigation because of that. The other context that I think about like that is prisons, right? And so I'm, I'm wondering what the Women's Rights Project might think about in terms of prison litigation and whether that's a space uh, to advance women's rights that the ACLU might think about taking on. It's a great question. Um, and the candid answer is, you know, we have not done much in prisons and women's rights project in recent years, and in part because uh, we have a national prison project that leads our prison work, um, much of it on behalf of women or even specific to problems that women are facing. This is the one downside to being a multi-issue organization. Like it's good because you have smart colleagues that are experts in everything and it's bad because there are problems that sort of affect everyone. And then it feels a bit like in this case, I think our National Prison Project actually is doing a very nice job of covering the landscape, but sometimes it can feel like, well, it's not my issue, it's your issue. And then that person, oh, it's not my issue, it's this other person's issue. And then somehow, you know, it becomes no one's issue. Um, so there have been times when we've collaborated, but, I, you know, I think the reality is we haven't done much there in part because, you know, prison litigation is a place where, you know, procedural and threshold requirements can make it so difficult to actually get to the merits. And like, right, there is an access problem. And so, um, when we think about how to spend our limited resources, frankly, it's it's tough to think about. I mean, I feel this way a little bit about, I'm like, we're really at the 11th circuit and jurisdiction. Like, this is not what I came here to do, right? But if this is what this is how litigation works. Um, and I think that's even more true in prison, um, but rest assured there are, I do have fearless, some colleagues at the National Prison Project um, who are focused on prison, but it's, it's a wonderful analogy. And it's true, right? This idea that, you know, you're from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep and everything that happens in between, um, you know, the government is, the government is watching, the government is dictating, the government's setting the terms. We did a policy paper last fall on these um, referenda across the country that had been on the ballot in November that would lift the um, slavery or involuntary servitude um, exemption for people who are incarcerated with a particular focus on pregnant people who are incarcerated and how they're forced to work um, while pregnant or postpartum uh, in ways that um, have a particular gendered impact. And it's, it'd be an interesting question whose bucket that kind of case would fall in, yours or the, the prison project. But you guys work across work silos across. all the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, the, uh, historically, I think that NPP has has worked on some of those issues in the past, but always in consultation, right? So it's just sort of the question, like, who's, who's out front and who's consulting? Um, which happens all the time, especially when you have like some projects that are focused on groups of people and then some projects that are focused on substantive issues. Like every person has a gender, every person has a sexual orientation, every person has an immigration status. And also we all vote, right? And we all, um, you know, we all express ourselves and we all do all these other things. And so, um, yeah, whose wheelhouse is it fall into? I actually interned at NPP and they had a fellow focusing on pregnant people in prisons. Um, but I did have a question. Reading the dress code case, something that was touched on but not focused on as much as like the practicality of skirts was how girls are harmed by like the fragile vessel stereotype. And I think there's like another argument to be made about how boys are harmed by like the chivalry, the strength, like those stereotypes. And so I was I was thinking about how that could be like an all gender stereotype argument. And so I was wondering what you think about that and like what kind of case you would need or what kind of plaintiffs you would need to be a vessel for like a larger stereotyping case. I absolutely think men and boys are harmed by gender stereotypes too. And I mean, it was one of the sort of animating principles that Ruth Bader Ginsburg used in her earliest cases. I mean, so many of those cases were brought on behalf of men. Um, I think of Stephen Weisenfeld. This was uh, the widower whose wife died in childbirth and he wanted to stay home um, and raise his then infant son, Jason, and um, was denied social security survivor benefits because he was a man, but had he been a woman would have been entitled to them. And if that case was all about the stereotype that, you know, men should not be caregivers. And uh, Justice Ginsburg believed, I think, very fervently that right, men were really losing out on something. It's not just that like women ought to have access to all of this work outside the home, but that by not participating in, you know, domestic work that had been relegated to women, that men were missing something very real too. And that everyone should sort of have the freedom to choose, you know, the right balance for themselves. And um, that means both sort of carrying your, sh your share of the work, but also getting to reap your share of the joy that comes from being a caregiver, that comes from being a parent, that comes from, you know, caring for an elderly um, parents. So absolutely think these kinds of stereotypes are harmful to boys. And I talked earlier about what it means in terms of um, sexual harassment and attitudes that 
young boys develop that I think ultimately will be very harmful to their ability to maintain, you know, healthy relationships, which obviously is, you know, to their partner's detriment, but also I, I believe to their own. So very great argument. Um, we do still <laughs> represent men. We represented men in our selective service case. We actually recently represented a man um, who was discharged from the Coast Guard Academy because he had become a parent. Um, again, very similar to this idea that somehow, you know, it's not possible to be a parent and a caregiver and also be a dedicated cadet, one that we thought was sort of really premised on a harmful stereotype that's ordinarily directed at women. And in this case was being directed at, at a man really to everyone's detriment. Um, that case settled before we were able to get to the policy, although I think Congress has um, directed DOD to, to revisit it. So yes, absolutely. I, I do think that there's, you know, in our case, we tried very carefully to choose one group of plaintiffs challenging one aspect of the policy. And so, you know, I, I, I worry some, that the idea of taking it all on at once sort of buys into the sort of unequal burdens framing or this idea of like, well, we're going to look at how you're harmed and how you're harmed and how so the person's harmed. Um, but a case on behalf of boys challenging, you know, a variety of aspects of the dress code that harm them in various ways, um, I think could be really powerful. And frankly, I think is a case we're likely to see whether we bring it or not, just the reality is that um, there are many more boys now who are seeking the right um, to express their gender in ways that, you know, was once considered non-conforming and that some schools are still trying to prohibit. Hi, thank you again. Um, I think a criticism I've seen of uh, impact litigation, not really like in general, but in the ways how it's operated in the past and in, also in the present is that, um, it can kind of perpetuate like respectability politics by way of like the plaintiffs that are selected are kind of the most privileged of whatever like underprivileged group um, you're advocating for. Um, so like we discussed with like a Burgerfell, like they were all like they're mostly like white male um, and like upper middle class or middle class. Um, so do you think that that's something that the people at the ACLU or just people in general, like the impact litigation space are increasingly aware of with like the larger conversation around like intersectionality? And do you think that you've seen like a change during your tenure there in terms of uh, maybe ch choosing plaintiffs who or taking the cases of plaintiffs that aren't just kind of like the most privileged of whatever? Yeah, no, it's a constant community. It's a conflict conversation that has been, you know, since I joined the ACLU and, and dating far back. I think the reality is being a plaintiff in an impact litigation case is enormously stressful and difficult, and it requires a certain amount of privilege to um, have the freedom to take it on, to say yes to being the plaintiff, to seeing it through to the end. I mean, I often think like I wouldn't be brave enough to be one of our clients. It's an astonishing thing when you think about it. I mean, our clients didn't even talk about some of the LGBT cases. I did, you know, our clients, Dave and Charlie and Masterpiece Cake Shop, and they had death threats sent to their home. Litigation goes on. We're at seven years and counting in Peltier. Um, we're requiring you to constantly show up, be deposed, talk to the press, have your picture taken, have your name published in the newspaper. And so um, it, it's something that can be, I think, a stretch for most people. I think it would be a stretch for me. And it's something that can be even more of a stretch for people who, for example, may lack housing stability, may not have the resources and the time to put into being a, a plaintiff. And that's not to say we shouldn't do a better job of finding people because I absolutely think we should and we must and we are trying and clearly not doing a good enough job. But I also think there's a certain reality that that being in these cases, it's almost like having another job, right? And it requires a certain amount of privilege to have the emotional and financial and physical room in your life to take that on. And some of what we're seeing, right, is like, who's going to be out there and be the face of this? Um, it's not easy. It's really not easy. Um, and there's a worry too about putting that burden on people who are already the most marginalized. So it is, I think, uh, complicated, but yes, that's not to say that we shouldn't do a better job of diversifying our plaintiffs and, and we're working on it, but I, it's, there are some real barriers. Well, and a lot of your plaintiffs are kids. I remember talking to Chase Strangio about um, Gavin Grimm and how hard that, I mean, it's hard enough to be a, a non-normative kid and then to be involved in litigation where you're the, the face of a of an issue. Yeah, I mean, we, our LGBT project represents a twelve year old girl in West Virginia, and they're going to the Supreme Court to just try and stop her from running track because she's trans. And like, I mean, what is it like to be her? You know, that's really tough. 
that's really tough. And I mean, for every case you see the us file on behalf of kids trust that there are a whole lot of kids who came to us with the same problem. And ultimately after talking to us and thinking about, you know, everybody hopes like, oh, you can, can't you just send a letter and make the problem go away, you know? And no, <laughs> um, we wish we could. There were times that, you know, there were periods of time on period, certain issues where we could, but on balance, the answer is no. And when people understand like, what's it going to mean, you know, for me and my family to be out there, that's, you know, not something it's too much. And, you know, and I get that. Just quickly, when, <laughs> um, just when, when you talk about finding plaintiffs and wanting to sort of diversify the plaintiff group, I'm just interested in sort of what that entails and to what extent the ACLU is, you know, thinking about here is a legal problem, which we think there's a legal solution to and is actively scouring for sort of potential plaintiffs who might have a case that would um, lead to potentially a good result overall, or whether it is, um, you know, reacting to the the complaints which are being submitted um, to you or cases that are already sort of in train. I think it's more often closer to the latter, at least in my space. I mean, marriage equality is an interesting example because that was probably the high water mark in the opposite direction of there were so many people who wanted to be plaintiffs in those cases because the cases were winning and everybody wants to get married, except for people who want to abolish marriage. Um, and so, right, you have people like coming out of the woodwork saying like, I want to be a plaintiff in this case, but that is not by any means the norm. So that was the high water mark of like, maybe you could have had the most pick of people because there were so many people who were coming forward and saying like, I want to do this, I want to do this. Most cases are not like that. And so I, I think it's really some combination, but within the priorities that you've said in terms of what we're looking for, then you're looking for that among, yeah, like people who are, you know, submitting intakes or who are going to our state affiliates or maybe we're filing a lawsuit and you see it on Pacer or you read about it in the news and you think like, oh, this is the, you know, this is the thing. Um, and so, you know, don't necessarily have the bandwidth um, or, you know, your your pick of the entire universe um, in, in part, because sometimes the cases that we pick are, are too good. You know, I mean, I remember after Obergefell, um, we all knew the next fight was going to be employment discrimination. And, you know, I thought, cause I just thought I was so smart that like we were going to win these cases. Um, there were so many companies that refused to provide spousal benefits to same sex spouses. And I just thought like, well, we should just win this after Obergefell. Right. Um, and we'll have this great title seven case. And, um, you know, like we settled all those cases immediately, right? Like that was a context where you could send somebody a letter and they were like, oh, you're right we can't do this. And so the cases that got litigated, you know, were not necessarily the ones that we had handpicked as to be the strongest fact patterns. They were ones that for whatever reason, you know, made it farther. Um, and those were the cases that really ended up um, being decided. And, uh, you know, the three cases um, that ultimately were consolidated in Bostock, you know, we, we were counselable for the Supreme Court in two of the three of them, but we were counsel in exactly zero of them in the district courts. And, and that's not a coincidence because it's hard to say at the outset, which is going to be the one that ends up sort of going all the way. It's going to have the right combination of, you know, irrational decision-making by defendants and, um, and other factors. So this is working with you this semester. Um, can you say a little bit for the students about what the opportunities are to work with the Women's Rights Project with you in the summers and the, as an externship during the academic year, what kind of hiring do you do of graduates, that sort of thing, and how might they get in that process? Um, so we do have interns every summer and every semester, um, and you all are in New York, so this is not relevant to you, but, you know, we now also have the option for folks to be virtual. So if you're spending time in other places um, and need to be able to work with us virtually, um, you can do that. Um, that is probably our sort of most robust way of engaging with law students. I mean, candidly, as I think will come to no surprise to anyone who wants to do public interest work. You know, the only recent graduates we hire typically would be um, folks who are coming through an externally funded fellowship. We do not have our own in-house fellowship in the Women's Rights Project. Some ACLU projects do. Um, and so, um, but we do regularly have, you know, and sponsor folks to apply for SCADA and an EJW and Justice Catalyst and the like. Um, and, you know, the reality is that our staff attorney position scale and notwithstanding, you know, people don't leave all that often. It's a pretty fun job to have. Um, so those can be harder to come by, but we do have a regular rotation of internships, um, which can be a great pathway to then being a candidate for a fellowship, which can then be a great pathway to, you know, getting one of those staff attorney spots. So absolutely feel free to hit me up or connect with Alyssa. Having a good experience? 
what's she gonna say now <laughs> i'm having a very good experience i think also like being in new york and being able to come into the office has been like very very fun i know like most of the interns i've talked to my co-intern at wrp doesn't do that and then most of the co like other interns at other projects um i've spoken with don't have that opportunity as well so i just think like being able to connect face to face like with ria and other attorneys on the project has been really helpful but um, I totally understand where Rhea is coming from when she says that she wants to stay at the ACLU because it's like definitely a very, very special workplace. Um, I've worked quite a few places and I just haven't seen like a culture um, like WRP has. So I don't know if it's WRP specific or ACLU wide, but I'm quite enjoying myself. So if you want some tips about how to get in, talk to Alyssa and then uh, ultimately you'll end up in Rhea's, Rhea's court. Thank you so much. I know you have an incredibly busy life and plate and full plate. Thanks for coming up and spending some time with us, Ria. Thanks for having me. So fun. <laughs>